There we go. Much better. Much better. Much better. So, well, after that crazy ass inter introduction, hang on one second there. Now I've got everybody on. <laughs> You're already entertained. Good. Hey, guys. All right. So today uh, we had to do this at a special time. I have with me John Mitchell. John is the uh, ex. Well, actually, let me put you back in here. There we go. John is the ex-husband of um, Nicole, Nicole Mitchell. Who, uh, if you guys have probably already seen the uh, the Instagram, you've probably already seen the videos, you've probably already read the articles. Uh, I had uh, a lot of guys on my Twitter feed ask me about um, ask me about getting you on and talking to you about your situation here. Um, I, I want to start things off here a little bit uh, first by saying that I my my point of this whole interview is not like to run you up the flagpole. I already told you that before we came on. Um, and as you know, I'm writing a, a book presently about um, the red pill and religion. So I have with me right now, John Mitchell. John is the ex, uh, ex-husband of Nicole Mitchell. I don't know how fresh that is for you, so I, I'll let you sort of <laughs> tell the tell the story as you wish. Uh, so I, I wanted to get him on. I have seen, uh, I've seen the articles and I've read the stories, and I think I got a good understanding of what's going on. Uh, John also, I should say, has his three kids with him right now. So if there's any kind of interruptions or anything like that, please bear with us. I'm I'm totally cool with that. I'm a parent myself, so it's whatever. Um, and this is just a, I want everybody to know, uh, be on your best behavior in the chat, please. And um, I'll be taking, we'll, we'll take some, um, oh, that was what was happening. Sorry, my bad. We'll take some uh, super chats if you guys want to ask some questions. We had to do this a little bit late because both myself and John are both on the West Coast right now. And I wanted to make sure that uh, everything fit his schedule. So, John, welcome to the Rational Mail, my friend. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good to chat. Yeah. Um, so, John, I, I, just to sort of uh, let everybody know, you've been following my work. Have you read both? You've read two of my books right now, the first one and the second two, one? First two, yep. Yeah, yeah okay. that's correct. Uh, yeah. I've kind of been following you on Twitter, I guess, for two, three years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So cool. Um, so you're familiar with, with what I do. You're familiar with the manosphere in general. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In general. Like, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you, I read both of them kind of like, how did you find me in the first place? Like what made you curious about like, uh, because I, I know a little bit about your background. I was just wondering like, what makes you curious about picking up the rational man? Um, man, I guess, I, you know, maybe it was just like somebody had retweeted something, a quote or, you know, how do you, how does anyone get connected on social media these days? It's kind of like you catch a retweet or you catch a quote and, and it mm -hmm. kind of piques your interest. And uh, that's probably how, you know, probably how, how it started. And then, mm -hmm. um, and then I probably just got more into it um, as some of this stuff kind of escalated. And then also I was, you know, I was reading um, other books that are, you know, I, I might view as like supplementary, like, um, you know, the boy crisis, for example, mm -hmm. uh, I'm working through that one. That one's kind of like a gut punch. Mm -hmm. um, Jordan it's Peterson's book. Really statistic heavy. I like, I like uh, Dr. Warren Farrell's stuff. I really do. I, I sort okay. of credit him with my own sort of unplugging way back when I was in the nineties when he, uh, what I, I came across a book of his called uh, why men are the way they are. And I think it was his second book pretty sure he's has he has a lot of them but that guy is a consummate statistician is that the one about like abusive relationships it's about uh i think it was about him really uh well first first of all doing his research because i think he published or he got most of the data during like 1986 to 1988 somewhere around there yeah and he used to be a um he used to be a member of now, like National Organization of Women. He was like one of the only men that was a part of that, and then realized what what they were really about, and sort of became Dr. Warren Farrell. Um, he's written the book. Uh, was it the Myth of Male Power? Uh, Boy Crisis is fantastic. That's his most recent one. He's got some other ones that are really good as well, like uh, Why Men Earn More. <laughs> and again, mm -hmm. consummate statistician goes to goes and does or drops all the numbers in your lap so you can see what's going on. You know, people just. 
they kind of blow them off because they just don't want the they don't want to have to confront the statistics of all this kind of stuff. But again, he's one of those guys that kind of frustrates me a little bit because it's kind of like Dr. Steven Pinker or him or even Jordan Peterson because they have all of this like data in their laps. And at the end of their talks, it's like, yeah, but I'm a feminist and we really need to work towards egalitarian equalism at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. So I want to, um, and and I hope I hope I don't get too personal here. I like I said, my my um my point here is not to sort of run you up the flagpole. I know a lot of guys are gonna go like, oh, he's beta the, the, Ignore those guys for right now. And like I said, everybody be on your best behavior because my point here is is to get to like is to un unpack all of this, is to distill this down to something that's that's understandable because it's real easy to go, oh, she she, uh, she belongs to the streets or whatever the whatever right. the thing is going. Okay, I get that, but I want to. I want to sort of go back in time just a little bit first. Um, so I know that you're religious. I know you come from an evangelical background. And mm -hmm. that's that's kind of important to me because I'm writing with a fourth book on religion and the red pill. So I kind of con am considering this episode sort of a one of my episodes of religion and the red pill. I, I started sort of a side project on uh, on this channel uh, back in 2019 where I get like I had a I had a, was it Rabbi? Rabbi Kaba was on with me. I had Abu American, who is you know sort of represents the the Muslim side of things. Um, I've I've had Pat Camp. Pat Campbell is is very much a, a Catholic. I've talked to him about stuff like this. Um, and so this kind of this interests me um, in the terms that it's sort of like what's happening in 2020. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you just a little bit of of context here as to why I wanted to bring the real reason I wanted to bring you on. Cause everybody said, Oh, bring him on. Let's talk to him about his wife. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I wanted to talk about this because what you're going through right now is a, a specific part in my, in my fourth book. And it's about how evangelical Christianity, something I'm very familiar with. So just, so we all know uh, that it's sort of gone through a transformation, at least since I've been a part of it. So I want to start with like how long, like were you brought up in the church? And was this something that like were your parents religious and they, that you just, this is something that you just kept going? Like what's, what's your religious background? Yeah, I kind of grew up in the Presbyterian church, um, but you know, we were kind of a nominal Christian family. Like we would go, uh, you know, to the typical Easter Christmas Mm -hmm. um, you know, my mom actually worked at a, at the church we attended. Mm -hmm. She was the uh, secretary back when they called them secretaries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the eighties and nineties. And uh, uh, but you know, I was like I was like a typical teenager. I was like, no, mom, screw you. I don't want to go to youth group. I don't want to go to church. You know, so I would rebel. Um, you know, sometime in my twenties, uh, I kind of owned it and came back to it. Um, and then. You know, and I was a part of uh, in my in my with my university. I was a part of um, a group where I met some you know solid guys, and and I was mentored by um, you know the the director of that college ministry um, mm -hmm. for a couple of years before I moved to Korea. Um, and then um, you know after I guess after some time of uh, our marriage, I kind of walked away from it. I got really comfortable. I got really complacent, and I didn't. Uh, I just kind of let it sit on the shelf and just kind of walked away from it. And I think, you know, that's a piece of um, a piece of the puzzle of, you know, kind of at least from my journey, um, you know, what uh, probably, um, you know, maybe enabled or, or kind of, um, you know, I wasn't as quick to, whoa, 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 pump the brakes on some of this stuff, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and so, um, so I was away from it and then, course you know things like this have a have a right. have an effect of uh kind of waking you up a little bit to some of the priorities you have in your in your life and things like that um, how old, so it's how old you now how old are you now i'm thir 39 39 okay so you just yeah. said 40 Let's see the, um, yeah yeah starting uh, i know i know gosh gotcha. <laughs> yeah. no, don't talk to me about gray hair <laughs> <laughs> you have you have three children with nicole yeah Right. Yeah, we have three. And so let's just so let's backtrack just a little bit. So you um you went did you go to a, a Bible college of some sort or no? No. I went to UCF, which is which is like the most liberal university yeah. in Florida. Um 
or one of them. But um, yeah, that wasn't uh, it wasn't a part of mine. It was part of her uh, education, but not mine. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and so you went there, did you, you got a degree and then that was, then you, uh, started teaching in Korea. I know it wasn't, you, yeah. you mentioned it wasn't military was the reason you no. went. There. No, yeah, it wasn't military. Um, no, I, uh, I was just teaching, uh, English, you know, they have these, um, these English schools over there where, you know, Canadians and Americans, they all, they flock there cause they're, you know, young 20 somethings and, tons of disposable income and they just kind of go and travel. And, you know, I kind of caught up in that too. Um, so I did that for a few years, uh, before, <laughs> before, before we met. So, yeah. Right. So, and you mentioned you met her in Korea and was she yeah. doing the same thing? Was, was that the, the, uh, she was more of a legit teacher than I was. I was just like hanging out with little kids and doing private tutoring on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, she actually taught at a high school, um, and she was like psychology and history and mm-hmm. a few other things like that. So she was a legitimate, uh, she had a teaching degree from her, from her university. Okay. And you yeah. met her at, what, how old were you when you guys met? Oh boy. I must've been 27 ish mm-hmm. when we met 28 she, when we got married. Yeah. She is younger than you. Yeah. Yeah, she is. I like three her. years. By three years, so she would have been twenty-four. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then uh, and then you guys hit it off, and you got how how long did it take for you guys to get married? Really quick, man. We had a quick engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, you know, we met. Uh, it's a pretty, I don't know. It's a funny story. Everyone's got a funny story, right? But um, it, it was a quick engagement, um, and I we met, I, and it wasn't like lightning and fireworks it was like hey you know nice to meet you um my friends were trying to set me up with her and i was like i'm not interested um you know and then and then when we met she was like two hours late so i was like Mm -hmm. forget it you know Mm -hmm. um but we kind of hung out after that uh, as a group of friends and then it just escalated from there so we really dated like two or three months Mm-hmm. Just trying to remember before we got engaged and then it was another, you know, seven, eight months before we got married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was quick. I mean, you know, you hear those quick stories all the time, but ours was. Did you have, um, quick. did you have girlfriends before her? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, you don't have, I mean, you don't have to give me notch counts, but like, did you have like, like relationships before her? Yeah. Oh yeah. You did. Okay. Um, you know, a couple of long-term ones, high school and college, um, mm-hmm. after college. Um, of course I didn't know anything about what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> that I know now, right? But mm-hmm. um you live and you learn. But yeah, I mean, dated plenty of plenty of girls. So okay. and when you got when you got with her, so she would have been twenty four, you would have been twenty seven, you got married when you were what, twenty eight and she was twenty four. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then kids came really quick after that. Yeah. I mean, about a year after we got married. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had our first. um, And then it was every two, two and a half years after that um, Mm -hmm. up until number three. And then, uh, and that was it. So yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm just one, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of background here just so that I, I can get an idea like where her headspace is at now. Was she, when, when you guys got together, were you, was she kind of religious too, or was that something she picked up on from you? No, yeah, it was mutual. I mean, she had a, a an interesting background. I mean, I don't know, maybe you want to invite her on the show one day <laughs> um, if she's uh, if she's open to it. But um, she, like, her parents are like her awesome. Um, they had, uh, you know, they were they were pretty pretty religious, pretty you know, Christian, like evangelical Christian, Baptist, Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think they kind of fell into the category of, um, you know, the part of the church that, or the part of the, the, the thinking and the teaching that, you know, it doesn't allow women to teach and, Mm -hmm. you know, you should dress modestly and you should, uh, you should, um, you know, kind of, you know, take second, you know, second seat to, the head of the household and like all that kind of, that kind of school of thought. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was, that was a part of her, her upbringing, which wasn't a part of mine really. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of learned about that stuff in college. Uh, but you know, even then this was like early two thousands. 
um, you know, the church was kind of starting to come away from that and let, you know, women speak and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. uh, that was becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, but she really grew up in, and that's when we met, uh, you know, we were both going to our own churches. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was a big, that was a part of, uh, of, of, of how we met. Um, and I would say, you know, yeah, I mean, we were both, um, you know, we would both consider ourselves Christians at the time mm-hmm. uh, that we met, started dating. And, you know, we had a, a pretty like religious wedding ceremony, you know, foot washing and oh, communion really? and, oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we have the video, <laughs> um, you know, as, as people do, but, um, yeah, I mean, that was a big part of, you know, the, the, uh, the majority of our marriage, you know, cause we, uh, before the dust settled, you know, it was 11 years that we were married. Um, but for the majority of it, um, we, uh, you know, we were faithful church attenders. We were Christians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you have a did you get a your church or her church? Did you find something that was sort of a happy medium between the two of you? Um, it was mine. It was mine. I found them uh, wherever we lived. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, it was just kind of like, or we would, you know, when we moved to Minnesota back from Korea, um, we found one church and it was okay. And you know, people church hop, it's kind of the American thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and then we found, uh, the kind of the mega church in our area that, you know, I really liked. I was, and I really pushed us to go there. Um, and then we were there for three or four or five years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's where, um, you know, we kind of both went into kind of leadership positions within the church a little bit. Um, and she was more, you know, being groomed as a, as a speaking, you know, pastor and teacher mm-hmm. um, within that church um, for a little while, for a little while she was. So in that, within, I, you don't have to tell me which one, I'm sure probably you can find out in the articles anyways. But, yeah, you can find out. <laughs> um, that was part of her story really was the fact that she at some point got into, I guess, women's ministry or she got into sort of ministry as like being a speaker and then speaker went to pastor. Um, that is really, uh, that's something I want to get to, but before I get to that, I have to, I, I gotta, and you don't, you don't have to ask answer this question if you don't want to, but, um, do you know what her sexual past was prior to getting married to you? Did she have boyfriends? Was she, you know, was she more repressed or was she somebody who had like multiple partners before you? Um, no, yeah, we shared all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had similar you know, we dated, we mm-hmm. dated around, um, trying to think. I'm asking, yeah, I mean, I'm asking this because like in a lot of the articles I read and maybe this is just something that the, the writers are, are coming up with or whatever, but I, I read quotes from her talking about how she felt like really sexually repressed or something. And that this is her sort of coming out kind of thing, or this is her kind of epiphany, I guess. Um, from I, the, the reason I'm 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 asking this is because in, and you probably know this is that in um in my second book in preventive medicine when I'm when I'm doing laying out the timeline there of what guys mm-hmm. can expect from women at particular phases of their maturity um one of the things and, and I hate to put this to you because you're in the middle you're smack dab in the middle of it but like when a woman gets to be about you know in her mid 30s to late 30s that's when she starts getting into the alpha reinterest phase again. So goes through the the epiphany phase, marries the guy that's that's sort of the good enough guy, uh, gets to the point where she's comfortable or whatever, and then decides that it's time to sort of detonate the marriage, and um, and then get back into almost like a new party years phase, I guess, before forty. And I have seen this amongst other guy uh, amongst other Christian guys, especially. Um, where they got together with a with a you know fairly good looking girl, uh, had kids with them, and then right right around 38, 39 is when they decided that this isn't for them and they you know they have to go be free. And it seems to me like the church is sort of enabling this right now with respect hmm. to say um, 
say gynocentrism, but certainly like feminism, for lack of a better term, let's just say like f- the feminine imperative within churches right now, and in particular Christian churches. And I don't just mean like Presbyterian or Lutheran or whatever. I mean like in evangelical circles, uh, in, certainly in, in and in Catholic churches as well, um, that it is there is a base of support for women going through that or finding a way to sort of, you know, be happy within the framework of, uh, I guess, uh, like uh, in a Christian context, but also still being, uh, I, I guess, uh, dealing with like feminism or gynocentrism from a secular perspective that is finding its way and sort of working its way into, uh, into Christian churches right now. And is really, I think, and this is so, this is something I put forth in, in book four is what I really think is it's it's assimilating the churches to the point where a guy like you has his family with three kids has his family detonated and the 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 wife or whatever has gone on to do whatever she's going to go do you know going to get her groove back on right it's uh what Dal Rock used to call the um, was it eat pray love scenario divorce porn right it's it's uh watch these movies and you know you'll find somebody better uh you need it's it's all about your own happiness uh a lot of the a lot of the oh that's the drum beat right yeah that's a lot about of your happiness yeah a lot yeah exactly a lot of the um a lot of the quotes i was reading from her sounded a lot like what i was what i was reading and I was listening to from uh, Jada Pinkett Smith when I did the the Will Smith uh, breakdown not to about what two months ago, and it's all it's all about healing, right? It's all about my journey of self discovery, and I, I'm just wondering how how she fits into that uh, narrative. I mean, what we can get to the religious side of things, but I was I was asking this because a lot of women, and and I'll ask you this: is a lot of women go through a phase of what I call making up for missing out. And there was, I forget the lady's name, but she wrote a book about it. It was called The Wild Oats Project. And the girl was, uh, the woman was married for about, t- almost about the same same age range as you're in right now, right around 37, 38 years old, and decided that she wanted to have a break from the marriage so that she could go, because she wasn't going to have any kids. So she decided she wanted to go and um, sort of sow her wild oats. That's why I called it The Wild Oats Project and of course divorcing the guy uh, later as a result of that. But that was what kind of prompted me to write that that particular part of book two about the making up for missing out aspect. And so a lot of guys ask me this, and I know you're you're already familiar with my work, so I don't think this is going to be a surprise to you. A lot of guys ask me this, they'll say, well, Rolo, uh, I, I married my my wife and she was a virgin or she only had like one or two and, uh, pr- you know, guys prior to me and she's faithful to me and I don't, you know, she'll never, she'll never cheat on me kind of thing. Um, and then later on, it's this narrative of making up for missing out and usually it's it, it's for women who are married kind of early uh right around 23 like right around their peak sexual market value years when they decide that that's what they're going to do and i think a lot of the, just the way the world is right now is that they um they see what could be and we'll come back to that in, in a little bit later because i got another question for you but they see what can be and they live vicariously through their girlfriends, through their sisters, through uh, through you know people, whatever people that they know. And I want to ask you that: is was there a point where you thought that she was maybe feeling like she wanted to make up for missing out, or was she trying to like live vicariously through people she knew, either online or girlfriends or sisters or anything like that at any stage? I mean, maybe I don't know if like envy was a you know a regret was a piece of. Uh, I think some of the, some of the, you know, part of her story is like she came out a few years ago. Um, I think it's more tied into that, um, Mm -hmm. that there's this piece that, you know, she felt like she was missing out or she missed out um, on that particular or that set of experiences. Um, That's the only piece that I know about, Um, uh, you know, within my situation or what was my situation. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's a strong pull and it's really interesting. Like, uh, at the beginning, like you were talking about this, this, this kind of, this thing is really creeping into the church and it's funny, like I'm not really on, 
you know, I'll check on on Twitter, like here and there, but I'm not on Facebook or Instagram or stuff like that. But it's funny, like, it's not funny, but it's like, um, it's interesting, I would say, just from like a curiosity standpoint, where I see a bio, it's like, Jesus lover, mother, wife, only fan, follow my only fan. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like, it's like, what is that about? Like, um, so, and just that somebody would, you know, put that, put, connect all of those, which, I mean, 20 years ago, growing up in that, that, that person would have been, I don't know, like run out of their town, you know, or something like that. Like, um, so to get back to your, to your question, I think mm-hmm. it was, you know, uh, yeah, like her, you know, her, her own YouTube videos and like, um, things like that. Uh, it's all like public domain, but, um, you know, I think that was a, that was a piece of, of, of her story where, um, there was some regret that, that, that portion was lost on her. And now that she was married in this com- committed monogamous heterosexual marriage, um, that, you know, uh, that she missed out on something that maybe, you know, and maybe that grew over time. I don't know. We haven't really delved into it much past that, you know, so. I um so you're probably familiar with the carousel. I, I'm trying to keep everything as PG-13 as I can for this because I don't. I want this to go. I want this to get as you know as spread as far as I can get it. But um, no, what's the carousel? I don't know what that is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know the carousel. Um, so I I I I get this from guys, and I think that they think that it's uh you know they'll never find their virgin bride or whatever. They've got these sort of ideals about like the quality woman, and I I'm I try to be realistic about that. If you've ever you know, read my stuff or you, you watch my stuff, you understand that that's, that's what I'm about. But I think that a lot of what is currently, I, I think upheld as sort of like these ideals are in, in 2020 are really untenable. And I'm not saying that, that they're not, you know, admirable goals. They are, but they're based on old order thinking. And when I look at the, uh, I mean, you're statistically, you're kind of an anomaly because, um, on average, the average age of first marriage in the United States for men is 29.8 right now. And so you're, you're coming up close on that. But the average age of marriage for first age of marriage for women is actually 28.7. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I so when I see something like this, like the fact that she would get married, like so, so she you were 28 when you got married, I'll make her 25. So mm-hmm. that and so that would have been 11 years ago. Is that what you said? So that would have been 2009, 2009 is when you got married. Yeah. And a lot's changed social media wise and internet wise. Totally. Different world. Yeah. God, ask me how I know. (laughs) Um, So a a lot's got, a lot's gone on. We didn't have OnlyFans back then. We didn't have, I mean, (laughs) but it was, it certainly wasn't what it is right now. And, uh, yeah, and I, I think that has all has something to do with it. I got a, a just a quick hit uh, shout out here. Uh, Reserve says, according to her Instagram post today, she's making more than twenty five thousand dollars a month. Is she paying spousal support? Is what he wants to know. I don't know what, um, I don't know what the divorce thing is. If you don't want to say, that's yeah, fine. But I would. That he, yeah, no, I'll just I'll just put a you know a blanket kind of statement out there. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't I don't follow her on any, you know, social media, I follow her as it relates to co-parenting stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't know, you know, figures. And then also, um, you know, our, our divorce settlement is still, you know, in the courts and stuff like that. So, So, um, yeah, I'm not going to comment on you. You presently have, um, you presently have custody of the kids. I take it then. Um, also, say i'm not going to comment on that okay. so. well I, okay just I'll, I'll leave it at that but i i was yeah. just curious as to like what her um you know her thinking was as far as sort of just aban- abandoning the family or is do you think that she's abandoned the family that's a good question i i guess i haven't really thought about that too deeply mm-hmm. you know some of this stuff a man like you know, and and you've said it before, both in your books and on your podcast, like, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about this stuff and you're approaching it, you know, you have all this conscious stuff going on and then you have this subconscious stuff going on and it takes time to really like figure it all out and suss it all out. You know what I mean? So that, no, I, I, I don't think, I don't think that's happening or I don't think, uh, consciously that, um, you know, that's, 
that that's something that she she wants. Um, mm -hmm. She has a great relationship with her kids. The kids love her. They don't know. They don't know any of this stuff. They don't know anything. They just, yeah, we're just getting, they know we're getting divorced. Yeah. Um, or we are, rather. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so yeah, I don't know. It's a good, that's a good question. That's, that's yeah. a hard question. Well, yeah, it, and it's a hard question right now because we're, I think, because we're living in an era right now where we've never had to deal with this kind of stuff before. We've never had to say, well, you know, mommy decided to go off and do, you know, softcore porn and, and be on OnlyFans. And that's a digital footprint that's going to last forever as long as the internet's around. So, yeah, uh, I, and, and then I also, yeah, I was going to say, and, and that's, that's, that's heavy, man. And, and I feel for you. So just let you know, <laughs> because that's something that guys have not had to deal with for a while. You know, we, I mean, I've had guys and I, I did, um, I did a, uh, an essay, uh, called saving the best back in, gosh, when was that 2015, 2014. And I was, I did it based on this guy who had found kind of like old um, like videotapes of his wife, like having like, like three ways or something with some guys in college that she still had hanging around and what he should. And the guy ended up divorcing her as a result of that, because like she, I think his, his quote was this, I, I married, um, I, I married a prude who or I met her, married a woman who, who bangs like a prude or something like that. I can't remember what the actual statement was. Uh, a whore who, who who bangs like a prude, and of course that was uh, that was I think that was a byline really for that essay. But uh, it it woke me up a little bit to uh, these guys who were having to deal with the uh, the unavoidable truth of like women's digital. Well, back then it wasn't a digital footprint, but like the the sexual past being something that is going to be part of your future. As well as part of your kid's future, as well as part of your your family, you know, who who have known her, who were there at the wedding, their future as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I, I, let me ask you this: is a lot of guys are going to say this? I already I'm already seeing this in the chat, so I'm just going to address this right now. Is a lot of guys want to say, well, you know, all women are are basically like this, and I don't necessarily believe that, but I do think that all women have the potential to be this, given opportunities such as OnlyFans, such as an increase in social media, such as, uh, you know, giving women essentially uh, the attention and the affirmation uh, uh, for, for their sexuality and everything else. So, so right now she is, let's see, you're 39, so that makes her, what, 36 right now? Yeah. So do you think that that has something to do with it? The fact that she's, um, you know, she's had three kids. She's still you know, reasonably good shape. Is that because, do you think she's doing this now because she wants to uh, do this while she's still this side of 40? Do you think that there's a sort of an urgency as far as, um, I mean, is she having a midlife crisis? Is that what this is? Yeah, maybe. Um, uh, I don't know. Um I mean, it could be, but you know, like the, the, the enhancers that are out there on mm -hmm. either on filter or through cosmetic means, um, you know, certainly turn back the clock. I mean, yeah, objectively, like, um, you know, I would early on, I would look at her photos and I'm like, these are beautiful. Like you're, I mean, you're, you're photogenic and like mm -hmm. some of these are really tasteful and like they're really artistic and, I mean, you know, guys aren't, uh, you know, to kind of paraphrase uh, some stuff I've heard from John Eldridge, like guys aren't, you know, sitting around social media all day looking at plates of food. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, um, the female form is the female form. It's beautiful, you know. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think subconsciously that that's that's a potential. Um, I don't know. I guess I can't can't answer it concretely. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I do think uh, you've mentioned this before and. I think you had mentioned this when I was like in the midst of, in the midst of, um, um, of some of the, you know, more harder kind of months that we had when we we're going through some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you had said, hold on, I lost my train of thought because I saw like a comment come up yeah, and it made me laugh. <laughs> um, <laughs> it'll come back to me. Just, let me, just let me go ask, on. Was there, was there a point where she started because 
actually let, let's back up a little bit because I think that when, as part of her story, when she started speaking and being a public speaker at the church, that was encouraged by the church, right? That was encouraged by the church. I guess the mega church that you were in, was that like something that they fostered in her? Was that part of like a, a woman's ministry? And then they put her into a, a pastorship. How, how did that, how did that play out? No, I mean, I, I think they, they I'm trying to remember now, you know, they really saw um, really good qualities in her as a theological thinker. You know, she would come up after church and ask really. Did she, did she have any like theological background? Did she go to seminary? Did she go to like Liberty University or something like that? No, no. Um, she did go to a, a, a very conservative university in, in Ohio. Uh, and she did go to seminary um, in when we lived in Minnesota. Uh, that is very, very progressive and liberal. Um, but I think the and the the big the church that we were a part of before she went to the seminary, you know, they saw in her a hunger and curiosity to of theological, you know, topics and discussions and and you know I th I think they gave her a venue that was kind of smaller, maybe fifty to a hundred people, and you know if you've watched any of her Instagram, like she obviously has a talent for public speaking, um, you know people. Well, friends that, you know, will check in They're um, they're like, man, I really disagree with her, but you know, like she's convincing, like with her, her mm -hmm. ability. Um, so she has this natural gift um, that now she's, you know, directed towards, um, you know, feminine empowerment, self-expression, mm -hmm. life coaching, stuff like that. Um, when did she decide to become a life coach? Cause I, I, I was looking at her YouTube and a lot of her YouTube stuff. Had, I mean, she hasn't done a video in eight months, but like, going back to like her first YouTube thing, when did she decide she wanted to be a life coach? Uh, I'm trying to think it was maybe two ish, three ish years ago, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, she tried on a few different hats with work. Um, you know, she was a bartender and she, uh, you know, made, um, you know, custom, uh, Gosh, what's the word? Like she was like a seamstress. Like she made custom aprons for kids, mm -hmm. um, you know. And this was something, you know, she knew that. Or starting a business, she wanted to start a business, and she's like, "I need a." So she thought about it, and you know, she landed on life coach because, um, you know, from her probably from her her upbringing in the church, and then also as a teacher, you know, she had a really good ability, still does, to connect with people. Um, and speak to them and to be an encouraging, uh, you know, person um, mm -hmm. on an interpersonal level. So she's really like, you know, off the charts on that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, th that was a, for her, it was like a natural fit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what she's doing in addition to, you know, mm -hmm. these other things. So. so that, that, that progressed from like 50 to hundred people to actually being the pastor of the church for a time, or was it just on a smaller scale? No, officially she was never like a pastor. Like she'd be a guest speaker or something like that. Um, you know, the headline. Did she, do, um, did she do women's ministry? Like straight up, like sort of like Joyce Myers or, or uh, what's her name? Yeah. Beth Moore. Beth Moore. Yeah. Big yeah. time. <laughs> Big time. That was I think right. she still has some of the, the books, you know? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I cover this in, in book four as well is that it seems to me that, I mean, this is no great shock that it, you know, today, uh, evangelical Christianity is really a series of franchises <laughs> and, oh, 100%. and to, I, I hate to talk about this because a, like a lot of guys think that if I, if I criticize the church, then I'm suddenly saying that, Oh, I'm, you know, oh, you don't follow the church or, you know, you're not religious. So you don't know. It's like, no, I see, I, I feel like it's incumbent upon me to sort of say these things so that people can wake up. I know a lot of guys that are part of like the, uh, Christo red pill or guys who would, would like to in some way make the red pill or, or the manosphere, their, their personal sort of men's ministry. Uh, they tend to get, lost in the weeds with with respect to the fact that it's it's a grift i, I mean right now it is and i i think it's a shame that it is that it is a grift but it's it, you can't you can't float a church mega church or the one that's in the strip mall and you know in orlando which there are billions of them you know um you can't float those without having some sort of secular appeal you can't 
float right. those without having uh, and the, the reason I asked you about women's ministry is you can't float those churches without pandering to a female base because fe- women are the primary consumers in the United States right now. Right. And that also transfers over to who's writing the tithe checks and or like, for instance, women's ministry, I see as a, a very interesting parallels in women's ministry speaking and, and self-publishing books and doing videos and, you know, basically doing sort of this uh, revenue funnel kind of marketing for wannabe Joyce Myers, right? Or wannabe Beth Moore's or wannabe, well, they have conventions, very, similar, very similar to the conventions that I see for sort of like success porn grifters to teach other guys how to become a success porn grifter, right? But I, but okay, so take that model and put that into women's ministry. And I think that a lot, and you can correct me if this is something that you've experienced, but I see a lot of that, a lot of the same business sales techniques and everything else that I see in sort of like the Tony Robbins kind of stuff, or, you know, go become an entrepreneur or whatever, uh, getting transferred over into women's ministry. And to getting transferred, oh, and and I think it's probably a little bit more seductive for women because we've got this sort of female empowerment narrative that's been going on in those churches for decades now, for at least the last twenty, maybe twenty five years. Uh, it's it's been well, women can't be the pastor, they can't teach men, but they can sit there and teach, uh, you know, seventy five thousand women in a in a in a stadium right. as a women's ministry teacher. And they're basically pastors. They're basically doing this, the same thing, or right. the single mommies, uh, the single mommies, uh, you know, ministry. It's it's this ministry. It's that ministry, and I'm I'm seeing the same kind of market, the hard hard sell marketing that's that's prevalent in sort of funnel marketing. It's the best, or the hustle economy. The hustle economy has come to women's ministry, and I, I wanted to ask you if that was something that maybe she got into. Did she want to? publish a book or was that something that sort of pushed her in the direction of becoming a life coach? No, I don't think she takes a, she takes a particular religious kind of perspective with a lot of the stuff that she, it seems like she's trying to wedge religion into this kind of secular empowerment narrative. That's, that's what I was asking. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it intertwines and is entangled with, you know, some of the message that, that she talks about. Um, that's for sure. I don't think, uh, but I think that's just kind of her natural blending of it. Um, I think you're right. I think it started in the music kind of department. I mean, you watch a, a, a worship Hillsong or like Bethel, mm. you know, like those are like amazing videos, right? Like, and they're monetized, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, so that's where it started. And now it's just like, yeah, there's gift shops and there's a coffee shop on your way into mm-hmm. to your Sunday service. No, I don't think, uh, you know, I think, the desire to, I think the desire to like preach and speak was just like, you know, flat out, like that was the biggest driving motivator for her early on. I think now she wants to, you know, write a book. And, um, at least the last time, you know, we, we discussed something like that. I mean, she talked about it for years. Um, but I think the content of it now would be very different. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the next, it's the next untapped, market right within the church it's the next blue ocean of does she still have does she still have, does she still have friends from the church does she still have kind of like a network of support from the church uh you know i don't know who connects with her anymore to be honest um i know some of uh or at least uh you know people who i'm connected with have you know stopped following her because of the things that are now public, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause they, they felt like that was disrespectful of me and stuff like that. Um, so I don't know, I don't know. Cause she, you know, she had a lot of ties in the church and she had a lot of ties in her seminary. Um, and her seminary was pretty like liberal and progressive, but I think the things that she's doing now, it's like, it's too, too far to the left for them, for, mm-hmm. um, you know, some of the folks at that, that seminary that she went to. So. And is that, is was that what sort of did they did the church kind of like put her off at that point when she started getting into too much of the lgbt stuff lgbtq whatever um because at some point and then this is in like every article i've read or actually even on her her sites and everything is 
uh, it was she suddenly decided she's bisexual. Was that something that like sort of worked its way into it, or did that just some one day she goes, well, I think I'm bi. Well, I think I think I think we knew where our large church stood on that particular topic because I feel like every church kind of knows, you know, and the the people that are regular attenders typically know like you know where they're where they land on um, you know LGBTQ stuff. Um, so once you know once uh, you know she kind of came out and came forward, uh, you know she kind of knew that she had to move on. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think through Facebook, I think there's still some people that are connected and maybe early on even, even engaged with her because they, you know, knew her and got to know her. Um, but I don't, you know, I doubt those conversations went very well <laughs> or went anywhere, you know, productive, that kind of thing. So was there, um, a, was there a point where they said, we can't let you be the pastor. We can't let you do this anymore. Well, you know, I think like just decided that she was done. I think prior to that, um, you know, it, it had kind of fizzled out enough to where it's like they just didn't ask her to come back and speak. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like a uh, – it was a, there was a, a couple of seasons there where it was pretty regular that she would be asked to speak. Um, but at that point, once, you know, once she came out, like then, you know, we had been um, not really attending, you know, at all. Really, at that point, we just yeah. kind of moved on. Well, yeah, I got a couple of questions here. I got, I let me just get to a couple of these. Christian Matico, sorry, I would put it up there, Christian, but it, I got a lot of people in the chat right now. Uh, he says, like Jordan Peterson said, everyone had the capacity for good and evil. All women have the capacity uh, to be on OnlyFans. Uh, doesn't mean all of them uh, are, but uh, all can become that depending on the circumstances. Hold that thought. Uh, Aaron McGrath also said, "Has uh, this is a question for you. Has, has John encountered anyone in the church who considers communal narcissists who just use morality and religion to hide self-indulgences and greed? Not sure I understand the question. Could you read it again? Okay, so he's saying he's asking this. He says, uh, "Have you met anyone in the church who considers themselves communal narcissists who just use morality and religion to hide their uh, self indulgence and greed?" Oh, for sure, right? I mean, that's, yeah, um, that's historically, come on, you could find yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a human trait, right? To a degree, and there's there's mm -hmm. always going to be some of them, and related to the first uh, quote that you read from that that other guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the human capacity for for only fans i guess is mm -hmm. greater greater than and some than others but anyway do you think that do you think that only fans sort of pushed her in this direction do you think that the because i i've been doing i've done several uh episodes of the, I, just last wednesday i did this with uh, aaron clary and then prior to that i was talking about bella thorne when bella thorne decided she was going to take two what two million dollars in 36 hours to show guys a black and white side boob shot or something um but that uh what was it i had a, a i read a quote about the this woman who or this guy whose mother was a college counselor and she said they had to have a meeting about all the girls that were coming into college wanting to know how best to go about becoming uh an only fan star how to make money off of only fans because they're seeing like what well, we just had a, a a second ago you had a guy saying like she's she's talking about making twenty five thousand dollars a month uh, off of OnlyFans, or you know, I, obviously she's promoting that through Instagram as well. But right. do you think that that was sort of what, like she said, I can make a lot of money at this, and I can be sexual, and I this seems like a better a, a better deal for me? Do you think that the opportunity of OnlyFans is what really kind of pushed her towards all of this? I mean, monetary, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the allure was there. Um, for sure, um, but I also know, uh, you know, for a long time, well, we we struggled financially, you know, mm -hmm. with three kids, and yeah, um, yeah, I was doing whatever I could to, you know, support the family. I was supporting the family, um, but you know, it was like most young families, it's tight, you know. Mm -hmm. Usually, was she um, was she out earning you at some point? No, never. Well, not until recently. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, now, but I mean, like up until OnlyFans or up until this, all this other stuff went down, was that? No, 
No, um, no. And then, you know, so I guess maybe two, two, three years ago, she started connecting with some people on Instagram. And I think one of the people that she connected with was, you know, maybe she had only fans. So she saw a mod model. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, uh, I don't know if she was a subscriber of that person's account. Mm -hmm. um, but I think seeing it in action and then learning a bit of the background and, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the opportunity was there and, you know, who, who wouldn't enjoy earning 25 K a month, right. um, you know, taking photos of yourself, you know, but, um, you know, it's funny, like there's a couple of people I used to follow on Instagram that like, you know, uh, the stock market guys, they're like, I'm going to get an OnlyFans account for my stock picks each week and charge people, you know, charge people money. I was like, yeah, you probably get some followers on that. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I, I, was, I answered the Twitter thing. I, I, I put this on the last show. Is like people on the Twitter was, uh, what if guys, if you suddenly grow, woke up tomorrow and you're a female, what would you, what's the first thing you do? And I like start an OnlyFans account. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I understand why it, what, why it's so seductive. I don't, I don't know what the long term effects of it's going to be. Honestly, I think we're they're kind of saturating the market right now. We, I don't, I wasn't even aware of what OnlyFans was until like march when COVID hit and then i started reading these stories i mean i I've, i'd heard the, the name of the app prior people were saying oh yeah it's the it's the patreon for sluts or something like that and i was like well what is this and then suddenly in COVID, everybody all you know women suddenly decided that that's what they were going to do to sort of make ends meet right. and i I, I didn't even really realize what the what it was about and it's it's really un, i mean it used to be that a, a cam business was something that had to be managed and you had to have people who knew what they were doing and uh, they're right only fans is a patreon for you know cam girls you know, the nicest mm -hmm. right um did you uh i gotta ask you this i'll ask you this anyways it's like do you watch porn on a regular basis honest question please give an honest answer you don't have to answer that if you don't want to but <laughs> not like let me ask you this instead of answering that um did you did you ever see her like i, I don't want to get too too yeah i don't want to make you too uncomfortable but like did you ever see her as um being sort of like full of herself or like really being sort of narcissistic or was she was she sort of um uh, I don't say self-centered, but what, did she really get off on attention? Maybe that's the best way to put it. Did you see that early on? Is that something that's been sort of her, her part of her character for a while? Yeah, I've thought about that because I mean, you're not the only person that's asked me that. Um, you know, a, couple, uh, a few of my uh, good guy friends, um, a couple of them are therapists, and you know, they've asked me, and um, I guess I, you know, I don't understand the trade enough other than it's like extreme selfishness. Um, uh, so I, I guess I can't, I, I, I wouldn't want to say like yes or no. I, I don't understand enough about it beyond like a surface, you know, Twitter quote about it, you know, when, when you guys were, when she was finally saying, look, I want to, I want a divorce. Or I want to almost split up, whatever. Did she tell you why, or was it just like, not for me anymore. I can't do this. I mean, what was the, was there a catalyst? Was there some sort of event that, that led her to say, you know what? Screw it. I'm out. Oh, I mean, that was me. <laughs> oh, you, were the one that, you can't deal with it. Well, good for you. <laughs> so so um, you that said, Hey, look, you, it's either this, you do this or not. Yeah. And I, and I know like early on, you know, you and I kind of discussed some of the, the main bullet points of, mm -hmm. of, you know, some of the story, but, um, you know, I was, and this is probably where people will, you know, uh, look at me and be like, oh, this guy's beta and stuff like that. But, um, which, you know, let it be known, maybe I'm the first guy on the internet to actually like admit that I was wrong at one point mm -hmm. and I changed my mind and tried to, you know, turn things around. But, um, you know, I, I, when these things were, were first coming, you know, to us, to me, um, I was kind of laid back about it and just kind of passive about it. And I was like, oh, it's beautiful. And it lights you up. That's great. You're happy. So it's kind of like this, uh, I don't know, in my mind, you know, I kind of equate it with a liberal man, like kind of not principled, 
um, to to some of these masculine traits where it's like you're in this heterosexual marriage and it's like, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this kind of stuff. Um, and so I didn't early on, I didn't um, stand up to that. And for myself and over time, uh, really it was just a few months, um, the stress, like, so um, within my body, I started to have some of these symptoms of stress where I was like, something's going on. Like my heart rate was, um, like in the nineties and eighties, that was like my resting heart rate insomnia. Um, I was having like panic attacks. Peripheral um, alarm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I look back and I'm like, Oh, my body was like, something's off, man. Like if you read 12, 12 rules for life, he talks a little bit about that. Like your subconscious, like if you're not in tune with that and you're not aligned with that, with your conscious, like it's going to mess you up and it's going to be ugly. And so for me, that was like, so I read that in Peterson's book and I'm just like, man, that was me. And it blew up. Um, and then finally, um, uh, you know, it got to the point where I was like, Hey, like this stuff's got to stop or like, we got to figure something out. So from there, that's really when it, you know, kind of hit the fan and, and it blew up and, and referring back to, uh, you know, Dr. Peterson's book, but like, it was like that dragon analogy. Like it just grew and grew and grew within me. And then finally, when it, when I, came to deal with it um you know it destroyed the house you yeah. Know? yeah and here we are and, yeah, and that's when i that's when i started deep diving a bit on on your material too um you know uh particularly the, the first book um and then also your, your podcast and stuff like that because i'm like man this stuff really connects with me Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there's an idea and I know uh, Jordan Peterson gets uh, hold that thought <laughs> I know that Jordan Peterson gets kind of like woo woo magical spiritual stuff when it, when it comes to like the, the dragon and all but what when I was talking about exactly what you're going through I did it in I think I put it in the first book was uh, there's an essay called gut check and I wrote that because I had so many guys who were going through something very similar to what you are uh, which is there's something off there's something that's making me stressed. There's something that's that's going on with my, you know, with my environment or I'm, my peripheral awareness is noticing like behavioral changes in, well, in this case, in your wife, but like in your girlfriend, your wife, whatever people around you. It's like some people, you know, you can in a, in a life or death situation, you can call it like, per, uh, was it uh, situational awareness? And that's in a more immediate sense. But like when you're living with it all the time, I'll have guys who will hit me up and they'll go. Uh, yeah, Rolo, I, I think she's cheating on me. I want to go snoop through her phone. Should I do it? <laughs> and I'm like, well, the, the reason before you go and do that, you got to ask yourself, why do you feel like you want to do that? Because what will happen, and you probably went through this, is that your peripheral awareness will pick up on behavioral shifts or, or tone of voice or subcommunications from, in this case, your wife, who is acting in a way or is, or is you know displaying behavior in a way that your your innate natural self says there's a threat to my my, my paternity there's a there's a threat to my my uh, you know was a uh, mate guarding you know you you suddenly have these mate guarding instincts that maybe you didn't have before and you don't realize why you're having them but the conflict is the stress that you go through really it's post post it can be it can escalate anyways to ptsd but right. what happens is your subconscious instinctual mind is trying to tell your rational mind like this is what's going on and then so you're feeling so these emotions that you don't know why you are because your rational mind has been conditioned to say ah don't worry about it she's not doing that you know she she would never do that to me you try to rationalize away what your gut is trying to tell you usually Usually guys get this when it comes to jealousy or it comes to mate guarding instincts. There's other ways that it happens as well. But I always say, why is it that you feel that way? Like it, like what is your, in your peripheral awareness? Cause it's not like something that's like right in your face. If it was in your face, you'd be able to go, okay, well I, now I know what's going on. But if something that's kind of going on around you and it's, and it's your instincts trying to say, trying to bring it into your, your conscious awareness or your, you know, so you will cognitively acknowledge the fact that, Hey man, she's, this is, not cool and then you have to find some way to to either rationalize it away or you got to confront it those are really the only two choices that come from that and so i I, honestly i think it's it's almost like just sort of our our base hindbrain that's trying to communicate with us and we're we're trying it because and I, i meant to ask you this as well is when you were in 
uh, maybe it's your upbringing, maybe it was the church or whatever. Were you taught to sort of accept a, a equal partnership in a marriage? Were you were you taught that you were supposed to be the man and you're the guy that's going to go and you have some sort of authority in your relationship and in your marriage? Or was it sort of go along to get along, sort of set it and forget it? Uh, equal partners, we're going to, because I hear the word equal partnership just thrown around in so many church circles and, and especially in in. Protestant, well, evangelical plus Christian, other Christian denominations, uh, that that's the ideal. And it, it seems to me there's been a push over at least the last 10 to 20 years to kind of downplay the authority men are supposed to have in marriage up until the point where it's about responsibility rather than the authority. And I think... Yeah. I'm going to ask you this is, was that something you had to deal with? Because at some point you had to put your foot down, you had to be the authority in that relationship. Was that something that you felt like you, you had no claim to, or was it like you felt like you had to be an equal partnership and you had to be supportive of her and it just escalated to where it got. So it did, was it an authority issue for you. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I think it was, um, you know, I was raised, uh, I was a child of, child of divorce and raised by a single mom with two older sisters. Um, and then she later got remarried. Um, so I had a stepdad, but there were some years there where, you know, I was just raised by her. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the equal partnership thing kind of came into my, uh, uh, when I was in my early twenties, I was a Christian and like some of my, my guy friends were getting married and we were having some of these discussions and a lot of the, you know, discussions around that were about equal partnerships. So, you know, I started the, um, you know, the the relationship, the marriage, like with that expectation, um, you know, and, you know, all of these things, like, and all the things we're talking about, it's like, they're just a piece of, you know, this huge puzzle that, you know, we find ourselves in now. Um, but that was, that was certainly a part of, part of my, you know, part of our beginning you know, the DNA of our beginning, uh, in their, in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think later when it came to hard things that, you know, we're going to, you know, Hey, this is going to be a, a drag out fight, you know, in the arena with, with, with her, um, you know, I would be, I would, I would pull back, you know, and maybe like have a discussion about it, but not really push my point. Um, until, you know, now this thing, it just got so bad. It was like, I'm either going to die. I'm either going to, you know, wash my mouth out with a revolver or, mm -hmm. or I've got to confront this because it's killing me, this thing, you know? So, uh, that's kind of where I was at. But yeah, I mean, that was, that was, that was what I was kind of taught was the equal mm -hmm. egalitarianism, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, which I think there's some usage of that, but, um, also I think men need to take back that authority and responsibility. And, um, you know, John, John Eldridge actually says a really good uh, kind of piece about this. It's like, if you're afraid to confront your wife about finances or something, you're afraid to like uh, bring it up and like, and, and so you don't, or you, you soften it. Um, then, you know, you're seeking validation from her and, and, you know, you're, you're shrinking back from, you know, God-given masculinity that you actually have. Um, so that really hits me, you know, because I lived it really freshly. Um, yeah, it was kind of a long, long-winded answer there for you, but no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. I, I was curious because I, I see that a lot even now from guys who would like me to believe that they've got some sort of claim to a red pill Christian ministry or something. And I'm like, well, okay, that's fine. We can talk about responsibility all day long. But unless you want to talk about authority, and I mean like establishing real, like taking real authority in your marriage, like I, I can never, I can never get these guys to like sort of admit to the fact that marriage right now is a real, and you're going to go through the divorce machine here in a little while. But going through, going through all that, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be MGTOWs in the, in the, uh, in the chat right now. You're just going to say, just don't get married. Here's what, this is why you shouldn't get married. And 
I, I can't disagree with the, the fact that the way we do marriage right now is all downside risk for, for men. And here it is in black and white, even in the sense like a, a lot of religious guys will tell me, well, if you trust in God and if you, I'll never get divorced because it'll just never happen because we're both on the same page religiously. Um, we're both like, I, I'm sure I will get comments about this saying, well, if he was just more faithful or if she had been like, they're not real Christians or she's not a real Christian. Uh, it's, it's what I call the orthodox paradox. And that's uh, that's a part of my book, which is you can you can excuse anything away uh, with respect to religion by saying, well, they're just not the right. They're just it's like uh, no no true Scotsman, right? There's just you know they're uh, they're not the right Christian. They're not Orthodox. They don't believe what I believe. They're not real Christian. They're not they're not Catholic. They're not this. They're not that. Right. So right. therefore, that all all this is invalid. And it's like, well, if you're just going to keep it in in sort of woo woo magical thinking perspective, then yeah. Okay, and that that kills the conversation right there. But you don't really get anywhere with that. And but what do you? Hmm? Oh, I was gonna say. But what do you think about like? I think my I know something I think about is like oh, it, exactly in regards to that is like, you know, I I'm curious. Like we don't have good models of that today or portrayals of that mm -hmm. that you know I can point to or you know we can point to or um, and say yeah, like he's doing it the right way. I think that feels right to me. Um, uh, you know, what do you think about that? Like, do you feel like that's a, that's a piece of it? That's something I've thought about where I'm like, man, like where is this prevalent? Like in our culture? Yeah. Well, I, I, I have locked horns with so many trad con men and women when it comes to responsibility versus authority. Because in most traditional conservative slash, uh, I, don't, I don't want to pick on just evangelicals, but just in sort of you know traditional Christianity, you know circles, spheres, whatever you want to call it, it's always the solution to good marriages or the solution to the masculinity. Because they all recognize that there's a masculinity crisis. They all they will all say that, but they misdiagnose it, and they misdiagnose it because that's the only way that you can sort of keep gynocentric power within a religious structure is by saying men need to take more responsibility and and they'll say well john you know if you would have just been more responsible or if you'd have just you know stepped up and if you would have just done these things then uh then your wife wouldn't be on OnlyFans, or your wife wouldn't be on instagram or whatever it's it, i i wanted to ask you this too so this kind of segues into an interesting question as do, are do you have any guys who are who have your back right now, like from from the church or from like guys are going, whoa, man, this is you know this is this is BS, man. Like you know, uh, oh totally. Do you have any totally. Kind of like tribe or any kind of like network that's sort of like have has your back about this? Like, whoa, I didn't know she was like that. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the the three guys that were in my wedding, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've leaned on them heavily, you know, through this time. In addition to uh, just before your call, I was just chatting with uh, another guy friend in the Midwest. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely do. And I, you know, I've, le I've, man, early on when it just, when it was like crisis, like, mm -hmm. yeah, like I really leaned on them. And, and that's the piece of, for me, like, um, you know, I think uh, I, I know I need like a company of men to, like go to and be like, tribe, yeah, here's, yeah, tribe, like to lean on and like to say like, Hey, here's, here's what's going on. Like, tell me what's going on. And they were, you know, they were the first to, to like pepper me with like, dude, what's this? Like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when, when some of the stuff started to get put out there, um, you know, months and months ago, like a year ago, basically. Um, and you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, pushed it off and denied. I was like, ah, oh, it's fine. Like, I'm totally fine with it. Um, and then a few months later, I'm like, ah, oh, I can't handle it. You know, like, no, I'm really not. <laughs> I'm really not okay with it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask because I, I have, <laughs> I've interviewed guys like this. I've talked to guys who have been involved in the church who go through divorce. And the first thing they report to me is that the church takes her side. The church, hmm. Like that, because right now, and and particularly, in, I don't know so much about Catholicism, but I do know that in in evangelical circles, in in just sort of mainstream Protestant churches, 
that uh, because they have become so matrilineal, because they have become so feminized, because they are, you know, by churches, I hate to, I hate to put it in these terms, but, but church is by women for women these days. And as soon as there is some sort of, and, and I'm quoting Dal Rock here, so this isn't just me talking about this. This is like me, like having years, of, like t- at least 10, 12 years of conversations with Dal Rock. I don't know if you're familiar with Dal Rock. He was uh, one of the biggest blog. He was, he was, I would say, the central figure in uh, the Christian red pill kind of thing that was going on at the time. I've been a part of his, his community for a while. Um, matter of fact, I, I, I quote him quite liberally in, um, in my, my fourth upcoming book. But he would say this is that um, once you are in a divorce situation, the church, you'll, you will see who your friends are in the church. And oh, yeah. I, I've had, I've had, I've had guys after guy tell me that they, even the, you know, the male pastors would take the woman's side uh, because, or, or the men or the el- what are elders, the men of the church would always take the women's side because their wives were taking the woman's side. Mm. And so I felt like he was completely a bit like, what am I, what am I doing here? Kind of thing. Like there's no, there's no divorce, like support group for guys in, in the church. There's no, there's no like, yeah, she, she, uh, what, what only fan survivors groups or anything like that. There's nothing like that in the church right now. Um, so I, I, I asked that for that. I usually, I probably should have asked you that in the beginning because usually guys will tell me that they had like, nobody had their back. Nobody was there to say, you know what? That's pretty messed up, man. That's oh, yeah. you know, because usually it's because their wives knew the woman or were friends with her, or they know some woman who was friends with her or is friends with her and trying to help her get along. And, and the guy either gets vilified or he gets the responsibility thing again. Well, if you just been more faithful, if you just been more responsible, if you just manned up and, mm-hmm. and it, it comes back to that authority thing, where it's men have a hundred percent responsibility and that's like, you need to live up to your masculine responsibility. But the fact is that they have no masculine authority and particularly in today, the way we do marriage today. So that's like one of the first things I wanted to ask you. I got in Southern one here. Uh, thought terminator says, was her family religious or controlling? Yeah. I mean, I knew, I feel like I knew this was kind of going to come up and I was trying to remember, you know, some of the stories, uh, religious growing up, uh, mm-hmm. or from what she tells me and what they tell me too. Um, you know, I think they've become more uh, kind of mainstream these days where they're not as, you know, strict with um, tattoos and like, you know, alcohol and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, but, but, you know, from her, from her story, and I think it's all out there. Like, um, yeah, I think she she has a lot of um, baggage with how you know she was raised, and that's a contentious point for for her and for her family. Um, but you know, going back to like what you were saying like within the church, like yeah. um, it's kind of been the switch for us. Like, or you know, a lot of people support me and like not her, and I know that's been a struggle for her. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I got this other one. I, I was. This is actually something I was going to ask you towards the end, but I th- I'll, I'll put it up here anyway. Uh, Juan Sebastian says she will try to come back once her gig is over, <laughs> and she finds herself. As she finds herself, right? Uh, like Jada Pinkett Smith. Oh, uh, did she come back, Jada? Well, she's still with Will, as far as I know. But like, oh, are she, they still together? Oh yeah, yeah, they, they are. That was the whole red table talk, and that. Oh man, you got you got to go well, watch. I saw the I saw the clip, and I was like, go get yeah. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of people that threw a lot of people off too. Let me finish this real quick. So like Jada, like Jada Smith, uh, uh, just remember to put yourself first or you'll look like Will Smith. <laughs> I have a similar story as you, uh, I speak from experience. Well, thanks for that Juan. Yeah. I was going to say is that, uh, the Will Smith thing is, I think people had this, um, they had this impression of Will Smith as being sort of this tough guy. I mean, he's, he's a Hollywood star. I like Will. He's very likable. I like Will Smith. I, I'm not afraid to admit he he's, seems like a cool guy until he gets on the red table thing with, with Jada Pinkett Smith, who treats him as if he's a kid. And yeah, sort of, I saw that. It's like, oh, man, this yeah. is hard to watch. Yeah, it was very hard to watch because, you ha- again, you have this sort of uh, mental impression of the guy. Oh, he's a fresh prince. Yeah. Um, so, but her whole thing was I cheated 
because I needed to heal or we needed to heal or it was all, it, it was just some sort of esoteric kind of, you know, uh, journey of self discovery. Um, you know, it's all about love. It's all about love. And I see a lot of that same narrative kind of floated th by your ex-wife on, uh, a, well, a lot of her, her life coaching stuff, of course. I noticed this, and I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody to go to her Instagram right now because I'm trying to, like I said, PG-13. But I did notice this, is that her older stuff, it's, it's, it's almost, it's, it's eerie to me because if you go and you scroll down to like, what, 2017? Or pictures from 2017 i maybe maybe was in and you notice this sort of change is transformation from 2017 in the pictures all the way up to where she is right now and mm. it seems to me like it's something that has been escalating either with her or with you both you guys for a long time right now and she's at a point where like she's saying i'm much more this that was the literally the quote that she gave most of the most of the people who were doing the interviews and the articles was like i feel like i'm finally comfortable now or and that feeds into, and this is no, has nothing to do with the church. This feeds into the popular narrative of the times, right? The uh, as far as you know, uh, gynocentrism, the feminine imperative, whatever. It feeds into the idea that follow your heart, right? Whatever feels good to you is is the right way to go. Um, what uh, feels before reels, right? It's emotion. Emotion does everything is, is where you should go. And what's best for you is really what's best for you, as opposed to having some sort of stricture or structure. And I think that it's kind of got like, people were just asking that, does she come from like a restrictive family or something like that? And it's like, those restrictions are buffers. They're there so that, you know, a family of three, you know, with three, three kids and a husband stay together and you're tight. So my, my question to you, for you is this, I, I, Juan didn't quite get to it, was if she decides, she says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the prodigal daughter. I want to come back. I, want, I miss my kids. I miss you. Uh, I, I promise I'll give it all up. Uh, is that something you would entertain if she were to say, I'm, I'm done with, I'm, I'm deleting all that. That's, I'm, I'm done with this. I made a mistake. Would that be something that you would entertain? No. At this stage? <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, you know, I can't speak for the future, but I know, you know, because I've, I've been asked that before um, mm -hmm. and I've thought about it. Um, I think we've both kind of shown each other who we really are mm -hmm. through this. And, you know, just kind of some of those things that have like sussed out over the over the last like two, three years, because I mean, that's really like how long this has kind of wound down. Um, you know, I think we're at a better place now, but I, I think if that was on the table, I would just pass. Mm -hmm. And I think she would probably pass on me too. Cause you know, like I said, in the, uh, and you know, when you and I were, you know, just kind of uh, chatting back and forth a little bit, um, uh, you know, and I brought this up to her before in the past, like I'm white, straight, male, hetero, monogamous, Christian, you know, I'm like these hated categories. You know, and I and I and I kind of do it jokingly, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we we kind of joke about that a little bit, um, but I think there's a level of um, like the I ideology behind a lot of the stuff that you were describing. It's it's like moral relativism, and it's just like, man, it doesn't fly with me because I, I think it's not livable. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's how humans are wired. It's not how we're. Mm -hmm you know, designed to grow up in these tribes and help us thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just my view. But to get back to, to Juan's question, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah I kind of figured you would. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's an important, I think that's kind of an important thing to talk about too, because a lot of guys would. A lot, or, um, you think? well, I think in, I think it kind of depends on where their headspace is. Now you're you're kind of an, I'm, I'm glad I brought you on because you're kind of like in an, an interesting position here because this has happened to you after marriage and now she's decided that she wants to go be an OnlyFans or amateur porn or whatever she's doing or who knows where it's going to escalate to from this point right um, yeah. who knows right and that's tough man I, and I feel for you and I, if I can have your back I will I will myself <laughs> but but I I see For that sure. yeah well I see that. and I, I want to have you on it because you've been a follower for a while so. Uh, 
I see this as sort of the reverse of what I see happen when a like a former porn star decides mm-hmm. to get right with God and she finds like the youth pastor and they go start their own tribe. I, I can point out at least three different incidents. There's three different stories where I've seen that happen where like a former porn star will go through her epiphany phase. She'll say, I want to get right with God. I'm done with this. Mm-hmm. I'm done with the, the industry now, blah, blah, blah. And then her whole story or her whole testimony, right? The, how, what, the reason why we should take her legitimately is she follows the prodigal daughter narrative rather mm-hmm. than the son right i ran off and did hookers and blow and and blew my inheritance and now i came back and uh my, you know i'm welcomed with open arms mm-hmm. and i that, that I, I i mentioned this before because i i don't know if you're familiar with roosh but like Ru, i feel like roosh is doing the same thing it is like he saw so that's his new persona is the prodigal son it works even better in a feminine centric society when it's like oh okay well the, the prodigal daughter returneth. She is no longer uh, for the streets. She's now for the church, and now we're going to allow her to be, you know, in ministry or whatever. And I think that in the church right now has become so feminized that the guys who are in it are only too happy to have a former porn star come in, and you know, because there's still that. I think there's a hindbrain thing that's saying, well, she'd be really fun in the sack. Oh, and she loves Jesus, you know. <laughs> and, and I, I, that's why I wanted to ask you that because, and I think people are, I've seen in the chat already, people are already sort of figuring out that at some point the ride's going to be over and there's going to be some regret there. Do you think she's going to have some kind of regret later on? Do you think she's going to regret yeah, the decision? That's a good question. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we worked that we uh, worked through when when it blew up for me uh, in therapy uh, was the depth of you know her conviction and really like the stuff she puts on there and on Instagram like it's uh, I mean you know she she knows like, how to it, Christianese right <laughs> well it's that it's that but it's like it's it's also the how she's you know formed her belief around some of the stuff it's really deep and it's really convicting for her. So I guess I, at this point, man, I guess I would say like, you know, God would have to, you that's know, her. Yeah, okay. that's, that's between her and, and we all know. Okay. Right. Right. Cause, because, you know, with what we've gone through and, um, uh, you know, if that wasn't something that, you know, pulled her back and made her more aware, like, then, I mean, I'm a great guy. Like I'm a catch, not going to lie. Like, um, but, uh, yeah, I guess I don't see it happening. Rich Cooper wants to give you a new chair. Just saying. <laughs> hey, thanks man. This was a, uh, <laughs> Craigslist fine. It was free. Thanks Rich. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I should also put this out here, right? We're, we're about an hour, almost an hour and a half in, um, but I uh, on on uh, let's see I what am I doing mine oh I'm doing Friday at at three well three my time uh, I'm doing a uh, the the online the Rule Zero online digital conference is going to be uh, going on uh, this week and on Friday and Saturday and my talk is going to be about the religion and red pill that's why I'm kind of glad you came on you decided to come on because this is kind of like a primer for what I'm going to be talking about on on all of that. Uh, that show. I, I have this other one. I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there just because it, it's the same dude that asked you if you watch porn. He says, my question was serious about porn. If the if he watches other girls, he should re- expect men to watch his. Now, I'm going to tell you why I disagree with that. And you want to have an open conversation? Here's your open conversation. Um, I Okay, well, we can, we can talk about porn for a second, but what I was going to say is this, is that the the deal is this, like, which the reason why people think this is because they're stuck in blank slate equalism. They think that men and women are exactly the same. So it's like tit for tat, right? It's like, well, if you're going to go and do a quid pro quo, right? If you're going to, if you're going to go do that, then then you know other guys should be able to do that too. No, that's that's blank slate equalism. That's like, uh, what is it? For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will ask you this though, um, and maybe this this is an interesting question that I, I cover in the sex part of book four, which is I, I, I get there's a little part there about uh, pornography and how it is endemic in 
uh, Christian churches right now. Because according mm -hmm. to the stats that I came up with for the book, 68 to 70% of Christian men uh, report having like a sex addiction or a pornography addiction. Um, do you, I, I, I'm not going to say, hey, do you have a, do you have a pornography addiction? <laughs> but uh, is that something that you see in the church? Because I, and this is just sort of off topic, I guess, but like when I was doing the research for book four, I, I had to sort of go back and remember parts when I was going to certain churches and everything. It's whenever I hear the word addiction mentioned, like back in the 90s, it meant drugs or it meant mm -hmm. like alcohol um, or it was like, you know, men, you need to do better and, and deal with your addictions. Today, if the, it doesn't even have to say porn addictions. You say men are uh, men. We need to be better men. And we need to deal with our addictions. Wink, wink, nod, nod. You know, like mm -hmm. we know talking about now sure. but really about pornography do you see that as something that's endemic in the church right now oh totally i mean it's been a problem for decades mm -hmm. you know with the advent of the internet right because it's like it's everywhere it's free it's available um you know uh, to, to go back and answer that guy's question i mean of course every guy has seen i'm no exception to that but you know part of my evolution of coming through this was like man i really started looking at what how I was responding to what she was doing. It, you know, you just, you go, you go on Instagram and it's like bikinis and, you know, yeah. so it's not like straight porn, but it's like, uh, it's everywhere. And I, and I, and, you know, now I'm on the side of like, and I have been for some time. I'm like, it's fake. It's an illusion. It's like, it, it's like this attention thing. Everyone look at the way I was born. Like, it's great. Isn't it? Like, you know, give me some attention, give me some money. So it feels really like shallow and fake to me. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at now. And I'm also older. Like I'm not a, hormone driven 21 year old like you know testosterone is just like i don't have any blood i just have testosterone in my body that kind of thing mm -hmm. um so i'm older and you know so that kind of tapers off a little bit but um so that's how i would answer that yeah i, I do think it's a problem and i mean like uh i've i've throughout you know the last 20 years since 2000 people i've known from college uh, whose marriages have broken up like you know those those men have had porn problems and mm -hmm. um you know and for some of them it has led to infidelity and stuff like that um so that wasn't a you know the infidelity piece wasn't a part of ours but um yeah i mean it's real it's real it's still a problem i don't mm -hmm. think they've adequately addressed it uh, you yeah, know and it's kind of a specious question too because it's like well so if he watches porn then he deserves what he's getting is that what you're saying mm -hmm. because i i think that's I'll be nice. Be uh, I think that's just crap, man. That's that's uh, like I said, it's a suspicious, a spacious, specious question. Hmm. Um, because so so what? Like it's is that like karma? Is that what you're saying? Is this is all right. it's the karma? Yeah. No. I it's uh, and you're right. I think it's the it's facilitating it right now. Um, and you and you're correct. Also, I another thing I brought up in the in the porn section of book four was um, that we have like a ten year old boy has access to a level or degree of sexuality that even like kings and dynastic emperors of China didn't have access to. Like you know Caligula mm -hmm. have you know access to 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 the kind of sexuality that we have on tap, free streaming live 4K. You know, pornography. 24 bit, hours a day, man. Men want unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, and that's where right. it's so again it comes back to oh you, responsibility. If you're more responsible, like that's that's a, a plea for responsibility, is what that is. Well, if you're more responsible, mm -hmm. then your then your wife wouldn't wouldn't have done what she did. No, she was gonna do it anyways. Like there's you know, it's there, it's available, and that's what's gonna happen. I I also wanted to point out that I think that a lot of people are gonna say, Well, that's just her. Like, that's just her like well you know no, normal women wouldn't do that she's just damaged and i wanted to make sure that you, to hear from you that do you do you, you don't think she's damaged right you don't does she have baggage does she have things that she was like that that drove her to this because i think then you'll find them in the comments people will say and I, I, i've said this myself before it's like not every woman will but any woman can and when you see one woman who is doing it, like people say, oh, she, that they want to say, well, she's insane. She's damaged. She had daddy mm -hmm. issues. She had like the only, I, I've talked with Sterling Cooper, who's a, you know, video, he's an X-rated video guy. He's a, mm -hmm. a 
a male porn star. And he was saying, you know, the, a lot of the women that are in the business, as far as his experience is concerned, is like they're there because they want to be there. It's not mm. because of daddy yeah. issues, it's because of availability and it's right there. And they were, you know, girls are brought up on porn just the same way guys are, but they, they take right. it and run with it in a different direction. But I wanted to get it from you. It's like, you don't, do you, did she have a bad childhood? Did she have a bad dad? Did she have, was there some kind of damage or some kind of baggage she has that drove her? Nothing, to nothing, no damage. Um, great, you know, by all, like, you know, on paper, like great family, great father, great mother, no abuse. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, nothing at all. You know, I, I think it's the, uh, just her thinking has changed around mm -hmm. it. Um, and it's, and it's, gripped her you know and and you can tell like the depth of that conviction like i think it comes out in a lot of her you know instagram and um do you think, you know, it, do you think it's attention seeking do you think it's that she just want I'll, I'll i'll give you an example and then you can answer I, i'm asking do you think it's attention seeking but I, I gave this. I I I I've talked about this when it first came out. But there, I, are you? Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. But uh, are you familiar with the basketball player uh, Stephen Curry from the uh, Golden State Warriors? Oh yeah. His his wife, uh, Keisha, Keisha, Keisha Curry. I think. I hope I'm getting it right. But her his wife was on the View, saying that, and this was like after she'd had a kid and she wanted to get in good shape, and she was taking pictures of herself and she was putting them on Instagram, and she would just she was just like almost breaking down in tears, saying, "I just want to." be you know i want people to to see me and think i'm beautiful or i want i want attention mm. she was literally i mean in in no in, in her own words she was saying i want attention mm. and i want male attention and of course you know, Curtis, you know he's there to you know pander to that because how dare he say she doesn't deserve you know that kind of attention to, to feel good about herself um and so i think that I've said before, is that uh, was it? Attention is the the coin of the realm and girl world. Do you think that she's doing this because she had sort of some kind of attention deficit after the kids? Because that's something that uh, I Aisha Curry, I think that's what her name is. She did something very similar, and a lot of women do the same thing. Is that once they had the kids, it's almost something psychological that says, "Okay, you're undesirable." Now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I read I read that um, either like on Twitter from something that you had said or maybe just a podcast mm -hmm. um uh where that that resonated with me i mean for sure um but um and i think that's an element of it mm -hmm. um for sure like uh you know and you would probably know more about this than i would because i feel like you're more studied on this but we we get a dopamine hit when mm -hmm. when you know that attention comes in or a like you know like you you get a favorable comment or something like that you get those little snacks mm -hmm. each day so i think that's that's an element of it and you know kind of me realizing that like helped me kind of check out of all that stuff mm -hmm. um you know like just to like uh this is just like you know it's not it doesn't do anything for me you know that kind of thing but um but yeah i mean i think that's an element for sure mm -hmm. yeah I, I i was i was wondering that because i know that a lot of people will say she's just attention seeking. I mean, a lot of people want to say that like women's egos get blown out of proportion because of this access to attention. And I would certainly agree with that. There's a, there's sort mm. of a self perception for that. Um, she, you don't think she's damaged. You don't think she's, you know, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like 99% sure that like that, you know, that stuff from the past. Cause I've heard that argument too. Like, you think she's, do you think she's playing the sort of the bisexuality card right now for more attention to get more, uh, I mean, right now attention through the roof for her, right? I mean, everyone's going to check out her, her Instagram and everything else about this girl because she's all low and it, it's not me that's doing it. It's like, you know, what is it? Uh, New York post and <laughs> whoever else is writing the articles about it. But, um, it was totally viral. Do you think she's playing? Do you think she's playing up to the fact that like what she's doing sort of resonates with women because they want to say, well, yeah, it's the it's that like sexual oppression, it's the patriarchy, it's uh, Christianity that tries to hold her back. Do you think she's playing up to that right now? You know, is that is that like mentioned in some of the articles? Yeah, quite a bit. Okay. Actually. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it would certainly resonate. I guess it wouldn't surprise me. You know, if 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 that was a piece of it, you know, now that she feels, you know, unleashed and kind mm -hmm. of freed from, from me or any kind of confines that I might 
as her husband and um, you know spouse would bring into the the picture there. Um, so yeah, I think part of that is like a rebellion against um, you know some of the upbringing and um, that just that like those real strict boundaries. Uh, now that she's older, she's, you know, in her thirties, that kind of thing. And she can decide her own fate. She's autonomous. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's an element of it too. Okay. Uh, John Alba asked you this. He said, has this experience affected your outlook on marriage from a Christian or a legal standpoint? Were you given bad marital advice by church leaders? Hmm. No, no bad marital advice from church leaders. My, the guy who mentored me, who's a pastor of a church, um, you know, in Georgia. And I'm going to swear, he told me, don't be a pussy, you know, because <laughs> um, I called him, you know, when this stuff was really blowing up and I was like, uh, you know, like real, like, yeah, I was, I was in the middle of it. Um, what was the first piece? Oh, the, the Christian marriage. Yeah. You know, like, this is what I wanted to bring up really that are just completely spaced on because uh, you brought this up. And this is exactly what I've gone through is. You know, I, I vacillate between uh, directing my my rage and my anger at her to all women, <laughs> to just me. And now I'm more on like, well, we're both. Uh, I think I have a more objective view from it now because we're we're so far from all the hard stuff that we went through. Um, but because we're both accountable for our own choices and things like that. But at this point, I'm more angry with myself. Um, and why is that? You know, because, uh, because you didn't see it or because you didn't like take like assume the authority earlier yeah i mean it, it was that it was you know there were moments where and i shared this with her like where i had a lot of anger and rage that would come up and i would stuff it back down that was about things in our marriage that you know just real basic stuff um uh, that would come up and i would just stuff it down and you know, over time, as you learn, like it just blows up, it gets bigger and it festers. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was, that's why I'm angry at myself. You know, like the whole dragon analogy, it's like, uh, you know, it's, she's not the dragon, like the dragon was within me. And mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't adequately, you know, address it and deal with it. And um, I just, I'm just of the mindset now where um, if I could time travel and go back, you know, five years, um, I think I would have just spoke up sooner, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, we've talked about that. Her and I've talked about that, but she feels the outcome would have been the same, um, you know, over time uh, because of her own transformation. Mm -hmm. So, so that's another element, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, but you've said in, in your past podcasts, like, you know, a lot of guys get real angry at women. Like they, you know, they, they direct it to all of them and they just, you know, swear them off and they become, um, you know, just done, uh, that kind of thing. And, and I mean, I feel that like time to time, but, but now I'm kind of like, man, I'm just angry at myself that I, that I didn't kind of buck up sooner and, mm -hmm. and, and look at my circumstances real honestly. Yeah. With what I, had, I, um, I got one other question that I was saving till the end of this, but I'll, I'll ask you this other one first is like looking back and you know knowing what's happened right now do you th would you have called her like would you said she's like nuts or she was like she had a potential for this like back before you had kids before you got married do you think was there some part of you that says well she's was there any like i remember we were just talking about gut check and and peripheral awareness was there anything that you would have said well you know she's she's kind of nuts no way man it was uh when we like early on uh, you know, one of the things that um, really attracted me to her was that she was like skydiving and bungee jumping and riding motorcycles. And I had my own stuff going on when we met, uh, like I was doing like Taekwondo when we were living in Korea. Um, mm. But, you know, with where we are now, like, yeah, I never would have guessed that or, you know, or thought any of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 figured you were probably going to say that too because i think a lot of guys particularly when they're younger and they get with some girl who's you know maybe she's like really sexual maybe she's like oh she's your dream girl right she's she's everything that you want her to be and, and i'm hey i i did the same thing with my bpd girl right i thought she was awesome uh i would have said she was a quality girl back in the day like when i was sort of in the myth in the middle of it 
because I I was I, she was crazy in bed and crazy out of bed, and I would try to find any reason to you know justify why I had to deal with the crap that I had to deal with back then. Um, so I. I have to I have to sort of balance things out a little bit here because a lot of guys I, I've always said this is that um, you know there's no such thing as a quality woman, and one of the reasons I say that is because it becomes an ideal. So if you say, well, you know, he should have known she, he should have known better. He should have known she was crazy. Well, you know, he should have known that there was going to be this thing called OnlyFans. You know, t- at ten years, at eleven years in, into the marriage, he was supposed right. to know. That. And I think pop, I, I think. Possibly people were going to say that like, well, you should have just kept you know, kept tighter control, kept frame control. And mm-hmm. if I have any take on this, I would say you probably lost frame at some point during the marriage, maybe even before the marriage. Uh, she, you probably would have called her a quality woman back then. And like you were just saying, she's probably, you know, didn't show any signs of being nuts. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. I don't know. Let's, you know again, hindsight's twenty twenty. So I, if I'd have gone back in time, like you were saying, and asked you then, you probably would have said, oh, she's great. I love her to death. Uh, you know, I can't wait to get married and have kids with her and settle down. Um, and you know what's funny is you would probably, <laughs> back then, you would probably would have had trad cons telling you, good for you, get married early, start having babies, save the West, right? <laughs> right. right. And, and, and just because, like, I, I meet uh, traditional con- trad con Christians all the time will will encourage the idea of getting married earlier, and it's tough. It's hard for me to like argue against that, and it's hard for me to argue for that because mm-hmm. I I know that like when women are between the ages say like twenty two and twenty four, that's when they're hitting their sexual market value peak. You got her like right where I tell guys to go look when they're older. Well, you were twenty seven, but like I, when guys tell me like they're thirty three, thirty four, thirty five, like. I don't want to get with a girl who's a party girl and I don't want to get with a girl who has baggage or has, is single mommy or something like that. And so what do I tell them? I said, look for a girl who's 25, 26, 27 years old, who is like right past that. And it would have been exactly the demographic I would have told you to, to focus on if you were like dead set on getting, you know, having babies and starting a family because she's just past the, you know, she's not flaky as, as, she, as much as she would be in her in her the peak sexual market value years, but she doesn't have the baggage that a woman in her epiphany phase would have. And I think she, that said, I, and this is my, my, my professional analysis, um, is I think what happened is she's, she's making up for missing out and mm-hmm. she went and maybe, a, maybe a little bit later in the game, but I've said, and oh, actually I, I wrote about this in, in uh, preventive medicine, is when women get married early, when they get married at 19, 20, 21, in this day and age, I'm saying in the past, I'm saying right now, from, from 1965 up to 2020, when you, and you look at the stats, the stats back this up, is that the earlier uh, men and women get married uh, today is, uh, it's aligned with earlier divorce. It's aligned with, mm-hmm. uh, with higher incidence of divorce. And, People want to say like they'll they'll throw out. I'll read article after article on psychology today or whatever, and they'll say, "Well, you know, these kids are just not mature enough for it. They can't handle it, or uh, it's because uh, you know women get saddled down with a kid and they really need to go to college. And they, you know, they look think of all the potential they could have had if she wasn't home playing house with hmm. the kid. And I don't know when you guys start having kids. I used to was a year after, so she would have been 26, 26 and a half. When you when she was yeah, 26, 27, yeah, yeah. somewhere around there, um, I, maybe for her, um, that seemed like uh, you know locking her down. Like now you got to be mommy. Now you got to play. Now you got to play house. And you've been see so you've been married for eleven years. Usually there's the seven year itch, and then there's the twenty year itch. Hmm. And maybe that's changing these days because we have things like OnlyFans. We have things like. Uh, uh, you know, social media is such a big deal for women because it, it satisfies that attention need. Um, so what I, if my, my personal take on this is that, uh, at some point you lost frame if you ever had frame, but in the midst of all of that, you had her, um, sort of wanting to make up for missing out and having three kids and then being mommy. She didn't want to play mom. She doesn't want to be mommy anymore. She doesn't want to play mommy anymore. She wants to play Instagram model, OnlyFans girl, uh, amateur softcore porn star for now. 
And that's why I asked you if you thought that maybe she would come back after this, like if there was going to be something that was going to sort of change her mind or she's going to, maybe she's going to get those maternal instincts and turn around and come back again. I don't know if that's going to be the case. I would say this though, I, I definitely agree with you. You should not take her back and there's got to be consequences for, for actions like that. Right. I would also expect this is when she decides that that in when and if she decides that that's what she wants to do, there's going to be people who are either in your family or your friends or your religious circles or whatever, who are going to say, Oh, you, you need to soften your heart, John. <laughs> you need to welcome her. But she needs, she, you know, she made a mistake and, and you really need, and they'll put it on you. They'll, mm. put, they'll put the, the onus of the responsibility for forgiving because that's really what Christianity is based about. It's right. all about forgiveness. I mean, that's a primary tenet of Christianity. And that's one of the reasons why Christianity is so popular for women because when they go through the party years, when they do things like this, there is always that sort of escape clause. Well, you know, I, I realize I, I, I repent for it. I realize I was wrong. I want to get right with God. Uh, God's forgiven me. Why can't you? And then you're, you're the asshole for not, you know, <laughs> for not forgiving her because that's what a good, that's Christ's love, right? That's the core wall. Christ would forgive her. So why, why can't you, you know, if you without very similar to what the guy was talking about with porn, well, if you watch porn, so he who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, that might work back then, but right now when we're talking about the age of the internet and the new order right now, that's, that's, you know, I don't know. Totally different. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I, I get it from a religious perspective, but I also get it from a worldly perspective because you got to protect your own. You got to protect your kids. You got to be. You've got it right now. I would say is that you've got to watch out for the well-being of your kids. Right. And if I, have, if I have any advice for you in all of this, I would say you need to put, that, you know, raise your kids in a red pill manner. But, um, but. That's gonna be tough, man. I, I I wish I had a better answer for you than like you need to like sort of you know be aware of the impact that this is gonna have on the kids because they're gonna grow up in an internet age too, and yeah. mommy has a digital footprint right now, and it ain't pretty uh, in those terms. My my other my other question is, or my question, my other concern is um, that you have two daughters, at least two daughters, and my concern would be that you need to be the the strong, positively masculine, if, if that's a Christian guy uh, who has the authority, whose frame is rock solid so that they learn from your wife's mistakes. They will learn from mommy's mistakes and say, you know what, right. this ain't cool. And if you do this, this is where you're going to be. This is what's right. going to happen. And I'm sorry it happened to you. I'm sorry this is, you know, we're not, this is the first time in history we're dealing with something like this, right? right. Where, where mommy is all over the world, worldwide, global. And right. That's that's going to be a tough one. I have a I got two more things for you. Right, we're we're, we're getting close. I got ten more minutes. But I wanted to throw this out there because I was actually going to ask you this too. Um, the the Mark Fuki man <laughs> uh, says, uh, please don't give up on Christianity. I believe that God is cleaning house and calling men back to biblical manhood. Uh, has this changed your outlook on religion or changed anything about your religious convictions or perspectives? Well, I mean, it brought me back, you know, full stop. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I walked away from, you know, I got comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And then, you know, I, you hear some other arguments against it and for it. But really what brought me back was just like, man, I couldn't escape. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't escape like God. <laughs> you know, and like, and so this whole thing was like me just opening my eyes and, and, and it changed, you know, my outlook on everything. So, yeah, I mean, I haven't given up, like, you know, I'm going back to church and stuff like that. I got another one um, here. Um, did this affect the faith of people in your church? Uh, man, I don't know. Probably, <laughs> I, I guess I, I don't have these, I don't have these deep co uh, conversations with any of them mm -hmm. uh, back in our old church. So. They haven't approached me or anything. Maybe I am. Um, I I'll, I'll I'll answer that really quickly. I've had to counsel guys who are in who are actual pastors who have had who had four 
four kids with a very gorgeous wife who was like 38, 39 when they, when she decided that she wanted to sort of go sow her wild oats, right? She wanted to make up for missing out and, um, and subsequently got breast cancer about six or seven years after all of that. Wow. Um, and, you know, of course people are like, oh, right? but right, right. But what I was going to say is like from, what that taught me, what that experience taught me, which because I was I was Royal Tomasi at that time when that happened. So I was, you know, writing. I had my blog at the time that this was going on. And I talked to the guy and just sort of got his he was also lost frame, very beta guy, who was convinced, and I don't know if this is you or not, but you can you can tell me who was very convinced that um because of his faith that it was an insurance against hypergamy it was an insurance against the kind of stuff that he actually had to go through and a lot of guys i think really believe that they think that it'll never happen to them because they're faithful because they mm-hmm. talk because they go to church because they're active in their community because they're they do everything by the book like by old social contract right there and you know whether or not that's true the the belief their own self-belief about themselves is that that and other guys should believe that as well when i had the discussion with um uh uh, who, uh, uh, Dr. Everett Piper, who uh, was a religious leader, I used to talk to when I was on Pat Campbell's show. Um, he was the he was the provost or principal or whatever of of Wesleyan University in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And I talked to him. I had a, a, deb- a debate, but a conversation about uh, marriage. And I, I took the anti marriage perspective, and he took the pro marriage perspective. And his argument was simply based on faith. Like the, I, I would say, look, here's the stats. Here's why, here's why, you know, I'm not anti-marriage. I'm anti-marriage the way we do it right now. Hmm. I think that it has become such a, a cluster, you know what, for all, you know, for everything that's happened. It's like, I completely understand why MGTOWs don't want to get married. I, I, I agree. I agree 100%. You know, I'm not going to go get divorced. So you'll be happy about it, but I understand. I would not, I, I've said this as well is that I would not get married again. If I were to find myself divorced or if I were to find myself a widowed or whatever, uh, if I were to find myself single tomorrow, there's no way on this planet that I would ever get married again. But it's not because I don't want to. It's because it's a, it, you, have to be, you have to protect yourself. You have to be cautious about that. You have to understand what the mechanics are. And I don't think that guys in your generation, guys in my generation uh, of the last four generations really understand that because we still – think of marriage in terms of the old way of thinking, the old order thinking, the old social contract that if I'm faithful enough, if I do these things enough, if I, if I'm constant, if I got to keep it fresh, I got to make her, I got to do date night. I got to, you know, we got to, we got to read Bible study together. We got to do you know, all these things that you're supposed to do. And you have to jump, you have, it's this constant qualification. And there's really not much for a woman to worry about because the state's on her side and the church is on her side as well. Mm. Right. So if she's uh, like, as Dalrock says, if she's unhappy, then she can detonate the marriage whenever she feels like it, or whenever a you know a, a better prospect comes up, whether that's OnlyFans or another guy or whatever. And I understand if you want to talk about like you know sort of challenging faith, that's really tough because a lot of guys still think that um, that Christianity, their faith, their conviction is in sh- is an insurance policy against hypergamy against. The sort of the, this natural new order that's right now that women are a part of and guys are still trying to catch up. We're still trying to figure the whole thing out. And you know, the best thing that most guys have right now is just, okay, I'm just not getting married or screw it. I'm not going to believe in God. I'm not going to go into this religion. I'm not going, I, I don't have anything to do with it, with the, the man in the sky or whatever it is. I, that's the, that's their rationale because they see stuff like what you're going through right now. I was very, I, when we started doing, and now we're at the end of the show, so I can admit this. When we were, when I was considering having you on for this, I had guys hit me up going, well, you know, if Rolo does this interview or if Rolo starts talking, you know, trash about Christianity, it's because he's not a believer. No, I'm a believer. I have a faith and you'll find out in book four, just what, what it's all about. I don't wear it on my sleeve and I wouldn't know what to call myself. If I did, I don't have any like really kind of affiliation or anything like that. I know like if you ask me about specific things, I'll tell you what I believe, but I, I, I'm i not a Presbyterian. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not an evangelical. I, sh- I don't want anything to do with that. I know what I believe and that's about it. But 
when you see those kinds of things, I totally understand why people would be like, well, if Rolo starts talking about this or Rolo starts asking these questions, it's going to make people, it's going to turn people away from the faith. It's going to turn people away. It's going to turn people off from Christianity. It's going to turn people off from all this. And that's why I wanted to ask you about that is like, did it change your mind about your investment, emotional, mental, whatever in your religious convictions, which I presume you've had for a long time. And I presume you're also passing on to your own kids. Yeah. So like, it, and it, it'll, it'll rock your world. I mean, it's, it will rock your convictions. And I, for sure. Like, Again, people didn't want me to talk about this because they thought that if I did, it would turn people off from the church. But it's like, this is a conversation that needs to be had and no one is doing it. I don't see it in men's groups. I don't see it. I certainly sure as hell don't see it in evangelical culture. I sure as hell don't see You're never going to see it in Lutheran or Presbyterian or, you know, where we've got women that are up on stage, you know, preaching to preaching to people like, uh, what's that? Nadia Bowles. I can't remember what her name is. The, the, the biker chick with the, you know, she's, she's just, this probably is a lesbian. I don't know. But you have you have that, but we can't get together and we can't have this conversation. Only in the red mm. pill can we do that. Only in, only right. only here can we do that. And they don't want us talking about it as it is either, <laughs> because they don't want they, that. It turns off to the organization. It turns off to the belief set, and I think it really challenges their beliefs. I had what well, I was going to ask you. This is uh, this got asked earlier on. And I was saving it for the end. Is like, would you get married again? Hmm. You want to get married again? Man, I don't know. <laughs> TBD. Let me, let me paraphrase. Let, let me put a caveat. In a perfect world, <laughs> do you want to get married again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that whole insurance thing. Like, if I believe that before, like I certainly don't believe that now. Mm -hmm. um, just the dynamics I've learned and seen and just experienced personally. Um, y you know, like my eyes are open. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a perfect world, man, I don't know. She'd have to be red pill. You know, like, um, or at least, uh, man, I, yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. You know, I think a lot. Yeah, it, it, I, I real, because I, I've been like I said before, I'm not anti marriage, but I'm anti the way I'm anti marriage the way we do it right now. Uh, when I was talking with um, Dr. Piper when he was taking the pro marriage thing, it was all just about like, well, you know, if as long as you have, if you're a real Christian and she's a real Christian, again, the orthodox paradox, then mm. everything will be fine and your kids will be fine and everything. All you, and if it's not, then it means you're not praying hard enough or you don't have enough faith or you did something wrong or, you know, whatever. And I've been of the opinion that, you know, faith and conviction is certainly a, 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 a key element, I think, in most good stable marriages because you need to align with beliefs. You need to, whether that's, you know, well, I think that's proven too, right? Yes. You have to be on the same team, right? Uh, you, yeah. You've got to be, you've got to be on the same page with, with that person. And that's, I, I, I do believe that that's part of it, but I also think that an over-reliance on that is what gets guys comfortable. And they go, well, I don't have to worry. It's, it's almost a form of what I call relational equity. And you probably read that in the first book where guys think that, if, well, I, 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 I was a good dad. I went to soccer practice. I went to all the piano recitals and I read them my homework and I did all this good stuff. There's no way she's going to start an OnlyFans account and do what, you know, there's no way she'll do anything like that. Yeah. It's not, a, it's not an insurance policy. It's not a buffer. I got this other one here real quick, which is, uh, says, do you believe that your wife actually lived biblical principles and did she have her chastity when she married you? I think he's asking, was she a virgin when you married? Um, no. And did she live biblical principles? Which ones? I mean, there's so many, right? Like, I mean, does that mean like she was a good Christian? Like, yeah, I think she, was i think everyone would um you know we went to church and like had small group and stuff like that so she you know like me ticked all the boxes for you know somebody that fits into a typical american church uh at the time but then we left and you know um evolved from that and now we're we're where we are um as individuals but which I feel like is normal. Like the chastity question, it's like, mm. man, I feel like most of my friends, like who are Christian, like they weren't virgins when they got married, you know? Right. 
Right. I, um, I, and I've, I've had that put to me as well. It's like, do you know what your wife's wife uh, notch count is? I go, yeah. And I also know that it's supposed to be like twice, whatever you're supposed to say. Right. <laughs> um, I also know what my notch count is too. So I, you know, and here I am 24 years later, still married to the same person uh, with a 22 year old daughter and it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I know that a lot of guys, because that's that's sort of like the leading question, which is, well, if she'd have been a virgin, then everything would have been fine. It, 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 you you probably would have said she was a quality one. You're nobody marries a woman that they don't think is like worth marrying, right? Well, I really oh. don't want to marry her, but I kind of have to. No, no, no. Yeah. That's that's why I, yeah. that's why I keep saying that the myth of the quality woman is just sort of this. You know exactly that a myth it's a idealization mm -hmm. because everybody when you get married she's your quality woman and when you're sitting across the divorce table at the divorce settlement she's that evil bitch that you you know married and ruined your life so it's it's stupid and it's a stupid idealization right. and i was also going to say is as much as again something else that's in book four as much as I think that I understand the reason for no sex before marriage. I understand that from a historical perspective. I understand that from a biological perspective. I also understand that from a red pill perspective, which is, you know, you, you know, the more partners a woman has, the less likely she's going to have a satisfying, happy marriage, the higher incidence of divorce, and the likelier that she's going to be an alpha widow because she's had access to more guys. Okay, we get that. And I've, I've, I've outlined that several times. But it's untenable. It's untenable in an age where the first, where the the average age of first marriage is twenty nine point eight for guys. You're gonna say, okay, well, you gotta wait till thirty to you get your, you know, you get the rocks off with a real woman, and she's got to do the same too. Well, these kids these days, they're like teenagers, and they're they're already active, right? I mean, yeah, it's it's untenable. Well, and then of course it's the sexuality, it's the the. the the access to it. it this isn't anything right. that's like these guys are like want to throw stuff at me i'm like well you know this isn't anything that it, you guys don't don't already know uh what, oh uh juan sebastian wants to get in touch with you uh juan email me and i'll put you in touch with uh with john okay and then last but not least what else did i have here i want to make sure i get to all these and that was is that it i think Oh, this is the last one. Sorry. Uh, it says, people still think that women are innocent little angels who want to be respected, loved, and taken care of. What would you say about this mindset? Oh, I still think they they do. Uh, but I think the whole idea that, um, uh, you know, they want that, but then they want to be treated like men with no responsibility that comes with uh, being a man. Um, so they want that that nurturing and that caring already built into you know yeah so it, so that piece in, in particular like really like man that really gets me like pretty fired up where it, it's just so confusing now within the the intersexual marketplace of like what women actually want mm -hmm. as compared to like what's innate and like and then the social media piece that that that's just like this weird monster over here um so that's kind of like a piece that yeah like i i would say yeah they they still do but but they also have this um this desire to have the authority that a man has with no um you know none of the responsibility mm -hmm. so yeah. that's my view though i agree i i, I again it's 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 authority without responsibility it's it's power without any kind of liability or accountability to that power and i think that especially when women get later in life and if there's i think that one of the one of the things that most women do when they get later on it's like you're i mean your wife is she's in decent shape from you know from a perspective that like what 70 percent 68 70 percent of americans are overweight right now she looks They're, great she's had three kids yeah, for kids, all after all that, yeah, and and so she's and so she's uh, she's capitalizing on that, but she's capitalizing on that at the expense of her kids, at the expense of you, at the expense of pretty much everyone else. And it's it seems to me like it's the most well, first first of all, it's the most selfish thing in the world. I, that's why I was wondering like how she justifies this. How does she how does she like come to the conclusion that this is a good idea that like there shouldn't be like when you when some when a woman does something like this it seems as if that it, they they believe that there shouldn't be any consequences like they like she should be accepted mm -hmm. for 
know what she is. And that's why I, I was asking, like, do you think that she's sort of playing up to the idea that, well, you know, she discovered that she's a lesbian or she discovered that she's bisexual and she's now expressing herself sexually and you go girl. And, they're, and they're, she's welcomed with, with sort of open arms. So, Yeah, a lot of people do. That's how they, you know, respond to her. And then also a lot of people respond to her like, you know, like like folks in uh, some of the threads, you know, I've been a part of. Mm -hmm. Probably when you first popped the, uh, the New York Post article. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, that's me. And then just. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I, I think she has. She's been she's being welcomed with open arms, let's just say. I, I, uh, I was uh, you're familiar with Nadia Bowles. What the hell? Is I can't remember. She's got a. Weber. Yeah. Yeah. Weber, yeah. I remember uh, we're reading an article that, well, you already, if you know that, then you probably already know the, the, how she melted down like the purity rings to make the big vagina statuette to give to Gloria Steinem. That was one. Um, my other, that wasn't even really like, <laughs> that crossed the line, of course. <laughs> you know, people, oh, this is great. And whenever I see sort of, you know, women in the, in the rainbow frocks and, and the uh, cassocks or yeah. whatever that there were, you know, I mean, it's, I, I see a worldwide religion happening soon, and I think it's going to be really this sort of, it, it'll be this worldwide, globalized, inclusive kind of thing that's really sort of no religion, but it's like, we accept mm -hmm. everybody, come in here, and it's it's what, uh, uh, was it, uh, Dr. Everett Piper may be aware of this term that I didn't know about before, it's called syncretism. It's mm -hmm. all right. We take all of these religions and we mix it into this one big pot and we just call it love. And if you don't agree with us and you need, then you're intolerant and you're a phobic this and you're a phobic that. And if you're not, if you're not accepting, then you're, if you, if you're, uh, it's, it's called love. And if you're not accepting of all that, then you're a hater. And yeah, I mean, we'll probably see a rise of, uh, or Unitarians. Right. I would I would not be surprised at that uh, syncret yeah. syncretic Unitarianism I think is 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 going to be something we'll we'll see within the next decade. Um, but I as far as Nadia Bowles was concerned, I, sh I one of the articles I was reading about her is she was trying to make a case for ethically sourced porn, <laughs> and I'm like I and I couldn't get it out of my head when I was reading about your about your ex wife about that. I'm like oh. She, if I saw her with Nadia, I would, I would not be surprised next. Well, and it, it gets attention too, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. a click, uh, click well, bait. <laughs> I'll tell you, and, and I got to, I got to break, but um, one of the things that I saw her as part of her quotes was that, you know, because she has being sexual now and because she's expressing herself sexually, that it's a holy thing, that it's mm -hmm. a, She's 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 justifying it in terms of well now that I'm being me and now I can be sexual I can give my gift of healing to other people and myself and he you know, it's the healing narrative and all that this the, the same thing that went on with Jada Pinkett Smith but it was all yeah oh here it was uh, thanks thanks for that Johnny B He's, she said uh, my sexuality is incredibly healing and sacred and when I give this gift to people it blesses them that was from the New York Post and that's how she that's how she's been justifying it and that's hmm. exactly. What I'm talking about when you see someone like Nadia Bowles Weber talking about uh, ethically sourced porn or mm -hmm. uh, let's melt down purity rings and let's get every vestige of the old order and the old social contract and all these old patriarchal religions that used to put buffers and, and actually, actually put buffers of responsibility and liability on women uh, that they called repression and oppression and everything else. So anyway, well, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I thought it was interesting. You, I think you brought up a couple of weeks ago or or maybe it was like a month or so, two months ago, but, you know, you had said, uh, you know, if Christ returned, he would get summarily canceled yeah. and like destroyed, like kicked out of the church, like within five minutes, mm -hmm. uh, which I was like, yes, that's like a hundred percent. I, I you know what got me, you know, what got me on that was, uh, that was, spa, that was, um, prompted by something i read by beth moore because beth like me too really worked worked its way into her church yeah. you know unsurprisingly went you know came into her church um and it's it's becoming me too is actually i don't know if there's a separate hashtag for it but it's like church too or or, or whatever wow. and I'm like well now the, the the guys the the men the males within those church spheres the the evangelical church um are paying the price for that 
accommodation for that compromise for, oh, we're going to lift you up. We're going to let you, we're going to let you go and, and be a pastor, pastoress here, or we're going to let you be uh you know, women's ministry thing. And it's almost this, it's this pandering because the zeitgeist, the secular zeitgeist of today is all about gynocentrism. So that's what put asses in the seats, right? That's what gets women in the door because it's primarily women that are in, in congregations right now. There's just this mass exodus it has been that way for 10, 15 years now, exodus of guys leaving the church because there's nothing there for them. It's all, it's all about women. And the only guys who are there are either boys that have been raised in the church or they are men who are married to women that are in the church. Mm. There are, you know, you can, people are going to say, well, not my youth group, not here. Well, yeah, I'm say there's pockets of that, but even the guys who will say that, oh, I'm in the church and I'm man. Yeah, I would guarantee, show me the, show me the group, show me the guy. And I will guarantee you that that guy has a blue pill mindset. Guarantee mm, that, that, right. that works. So anyways, it's been a really good talk. I had no idea we were going to go this long. Actually, I thought we were going to we give it up for 90 minutes. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, John, thank you for your, your help with all of this. I'd love to have you back on too. If we have a, if we have another topic to talk about with respect to like religion and the red pill at some time. So I'm going to keep you on reserve. Um, is there anything you wanted to, to, to let anybody know, like, I mean, I, I hope you're okay, man. I you need help. There's, there's a, you definitely have a tribe in the red pill. I'll give you that right now. No, I saw that. That was interesting. I guess I wasn't sure what to expect from, uh, you know, when I kind of put myself out there and commented on that initial post, but I mean, people were pretty cool, like supportive, like concerned about the kids. Um, and I mean, I, uh, you know, just the, the process of going through it, um, you know, I think we're both like, we're both pretty well moved on. Mm. I mean, I don't, but I don't follow her on social media. She doesn't pretty sure she doesn't follow me. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't really post anything either. <laughs> yeah. um, that's just kind of my style, but, um, but yeah, no, uh, I'm good. I appreciate, you know, being on and just kind of sharing my, my side of it and not, you know, um, you know, not getting dragged through the mud or anything like that. So this was, uh, this was good. It's fun. Right. Right. Well, you just, just to let you know that you can always talk to me. You can always talk to these guys. I mean, cause technically you're kind of getting zeroed out here. So <laughs> I, want to, I want to let you know that you do have at least some kind of a network of guys within the red pill, the manosphere community. So cool. Yeah. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, man. This has been really good. Uh, I will be, there will be no rule zero on Saturday because we are doing rule zero live, which is the online conference that will start at 11 AM on Friday. Uh, if you didn't get tickets, sorry, uh, they're all gone now. <laughs> uh, we had a limited registration and, uh, so we'll be doing that for, I'll be doing that for five hours on Friday and five hours on Saturday. So, uh, that will be the online uh, convention conference thing that we're doing uh, sort of in place of the Vegas uh, live event that we were supposed to do, but COVID decided that we were not going to do it. Um, other thing is, is that we will be doing a live event in Vegas in 2021. Um, we're looking at spring, probably like uh, middle of spring, maybe um, beginning of May or something like that. So we're talking about it just to let you guys know we're still planning on doing a live event. We just felt like we needed to do this right now. So that will be going on. There won't be any uh, rule zero because we'll be busy doing that, but there will be a Sunday show of this show uh, on my regular time, which is 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Thanks, uh, John. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, I will, I'm going to keep you on speed dial. Man. I'm going to keep you in, keep you in the, in the back burner. Cool. cool. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, John. Bye-bye. Have a good night.